On this episode of Faith and Focus, I want to discuss the overly sensitive reaction to the wokeism that pervades our culture. Much of the culture seems to be on a progressive march with diversity, equity, and, and inclusion as an all-encompassing mantra. However, I want to discuss how conservatives and Christians within the conservative movement have reacted inappropriately to this movement. And I want to discuss Apple TV's show Foundation being a prime example of what I mean. And so I hope you enjoy this episode. Hey guys, if you've been a listener of Faith and Focus for a while and have enjoyed what you've been hearing, I would love it if you would consider becoming a monthly supporter of the ministry. As a missionary within faith, my work is entirely supported by listeners like you who believe in the work God has called me to do, and podcasting is just a small part of that. I also teach the Bible at my local church, in the ministry house I live in, and with the young men God has put in my life to disciple. I also do biblical counseling that is entirely donation-based, so your monthly support goes in part to help support counseling sessions for people who may not be able to afford any or all of the cost of counseling. And with your monthly support, I would be able to go on to full-time ministry, which would include more podcast recording, new podcast ideas that we've had, and different forms of online teaching, as well as more availability for counseling sessions. If you'd like to become a monthly supporter, you can email me at dennissotherby at infaith.org or head over to infaith backslash dennis Sotherby. Thank you. Well, as I said in the intro, I think that it's obvious that our culture is split down the middle with progressives having a certain agenda and this is kind of lumped up in this uh, diversity equity and inclusion camp where just the all-encompassing point of everything is to have diversity that matches the culture and inclusion of anyone and everyone and so you know of course that it has its problems you know the example that people often point to would be things like affirmative action where you're just privileging certain groups of people and you just have to have you know they call them token characters where you just throw in people to fit a diversity quota and that's obviously ridiculous well maybe it's not obvious to some people but it's obvious to me that that is just ridiculous on its on its face and i believe it's anti-christian i think that christianity should value the individual And I think that that's one of the things that we've learned, hopefully, in American history is that any individual and all individuals are valuable. And we need to treat people as individuals. You know, this is, of course, why racism is wrong to just, and I've talked about this in a previous episode, but that's why it's wrong to just be like, you know, well, black people are just, they just commit crime. So you got to watch out for black people. Oh, if black people move into your neighborhood, you just got to watch out because they're going to bring in some crime, you know, like, that's ridiculous. You just you can't just treat a group a certain way because certain individuals within that group act that way. And of course, that's why racism at, at the the most basis level is ridiculous because it's not viewing people as individuals. So, we uh we we rightly I think fight against that in this progressive movement. This idea that we need to just have you know, black people, people of color, minorities, oppressed people, whatever, just put them in these positions in, in you know, entertainment, politics, education, whatever. It doesn't, we're not concerned about credentialing. No, I don't think that necessarily a diversity hire means that they are not good at what they're going to be doing, but that, that their talent is not one of the, the, the most primary things that we're looking for. It's just, does your skin look a certain color? Does your sexuality match a certain demographic to me that's wrong that is just heading in the wrong direction now the opposite that i really want to speak to is conservatives and our reaction to that and christianity are the, the to the extent that the venn diagram of conservatism and christianity overlaps a lot of christians buy into conservatism and unfortunately 
that means that conservative Christians are often just reacting. And this is true within conservatism as a whole, but Christianity, there's a moral component to it. But just reacting to this progressive agenda blindly is to me just the opposite. It's the same problem, but it's just the opposite side of the same coin. And, you know, this gets manifested every time, you know, a a movie comes out and people, conservative people, you know, will look, you know, the most classic one more recently is The Little Mermaid. They made Ariel, they cast a black woman as Ariel. And so everyone's just, that's the whole thing. It's just everyone's just making a big deal out of Ariel's black. Oh, Ariel can't be, why she shouldn't be black. She's white and she's whatever. And then people saying, well, why do you care? She's just a fictional character it doesn't matter what skin color she is. She's a fiction, not only a fictional character, but a mythological creature. She doesn't even exist um, in any kind of history. And so it it does seem ridiculous. Now, of course, the question gets flipped on, you know, if the progressives are going to say, well, why is it important to you that she's black? What what does it matter? Well, why do they, why does she have to be cast as black? And of course their, their point is, well, inclusion and representation matters. So, okay. So that's their point. But the problem is then conservatives react and they and they say, well, it, this is just wokeism. This is just uh, diversity. This movie is going to suck. This is going to be terrible. I'm not watching this movie. Well, then, really, what you're what you're saying is that race does matter to you. Now, we as conservatives and Christians in particular, we tout this idea that hey, race doesn't matter to us. We are all individuals, right? Individuals should, you know, be judged based on their own merit, their own character, their own talent, whatever it might be. Oh, but if I see a black person or a gay person, whatever it might be, representing somebody in a movie that typically, you know, whatever, it's a remake and the per- person was a different, they were white before. Oh, well, that, that's, I'm not, I'm not taking part. In it. I'm not going to watch that. And to me, I'm just like, I mean, and, and I see it. I, I, I do think, it, I think it's ridiculous that they, they are on a, crusade to replace every um white person with a person of color of course it's all ridiculous but it's the world this i mean this is the world system this is why for us as christians we really should not be playing this game because this is just ridiculous to to view people and things through this lens is how the world operates but i do think that we as conservative and conservative christians have to realize that if we are going to to preach and to propagate this belief that we don't care about race. What we care about is quality, quality leadership, quality politicians, quality musicians, quality actors, quality movies. That's all we care about. Then you can't at the same time say, oh, they've cast a black person in that role or, oh, they've cast a, a, a Latino in that role. Oh, that person was white in, in the in the previous, you know, when they made this movie 60 years ago. Oh, now they're now they're black. I, I'm not watching this. This is wokeism. And to me, I'm like, no, that's just racism to just say you're not going to watch something because they've cast somebody who's not white. And I don't think that's the way that we should approach these things because there are examples where, okay, you know, the world is going to world, right? They're going to do what the world does. So these movie companies, of course, they're going to play racial politics. They're going to have these quotas. And you know, by and large, it, it sucks. I, I wish that people in those industries didn't have to play those games. But you know, some people either buy into that belief or they just think, "Well, we gotta, you know, we gotta do what we can do." And so they play the game. And you know, the actors they might not be like, "Whatever, I don't care about this. I just want to work." The people that write, they just want to write scripts. The people that direct just want to direct. So if we're gonna punish, you know, movies and cinema, just because of this, because, oh, there's a black person I'm looking at instead of a white person, that seems pretty narrow-minded. I think, I mean, if you don't want to watch the movie or consume the product, whatever, that's fine. But to say it's because this person is not white uh, seems like you're playing playing the race card. To me, I think, view the product, watch it, and if it actually is ideologically bankrupt, if it actually is progressive and woke, and, you know, whatever, however you want to, whatever negative word you want to slap onto it, if it actually is those things, then criticize it on that merit. Because I do think that there are things that are just never given a chance because we immediately react like, 
like progressives would and say, oh, I don't see a white person where there should be a white person. I'm not going to see this thing. And because there are people within the entertainment industry that who are conservatives or at least not progressive and crazy, they are actually putting out content that we wouldn't find objectionable, but we are only finding it objectionable because, oh, well, they put a black person in that, in that role instead of a white person. And so that brings me to the show Foundation. And I'm not going to go into huge depths. I mean, there probably will be spoilers, but the show's been out for about a year now. If you haven't seen it, um, you should see it because it was decent. Kind of a slog. It probably could have been maybe eight episodes instead of ten, but but I thought it was decent. And this is, you know, this is coming from you know me, who I was a huge fan. I am a huge fan of Isaac Asimov. Um, huge fan of just uh, the science fiction genre. His books. Huge fan of the Foundation series. I've probably read the Foundation trilogy. Now well, there's quite a few like sequels and you know the fourth and fifth book, and then there's prequels and all this other stuff. But those ones aren't as great, but I really like the original trilogy. I think, you know, they are rightly considered like must reads if you are a fan of science fiction. They are pretty foundational, no pun intended, to the genre. And I, I think they're really good. And for years, they've, and I think they came out in the 40s and 50s, the original trilogy. And for years, they've talked about making a movie, making them into movies. But the, the thing that's difficult about in the past was difficult about making movies is because the books span such an, such a huge amount of time. You know, the first book has several different parts and each part is, you know, one section ends and then 50 years jumps ahead into, you know, 50 years into the future. And then after that, another 50 years, you know, so the characters are always rotating. And once you have one character for 50 pages, they're gone. Well, you can't really make a movie that's that expansive, but now, with the onset of kind of TV shows and, and, and Netflix being able to, to tell these longer stories, they finally decided to do it. And so Apple has the, the rights to it. And I was excited when I heard that they were, uh, do, were, were going to be making it into a TV show. Again, I was a huge fan of the, the books. And so I was excited. And then I think uh, David Goyer was one of the creators and writers. And he, I know he had worked with um, Christopher Nolan on the Batman movies. And so I really liked him and I thought, okay, this is, I think this is going to be good. And then the trailer came out and I will right now I'm going to cut and I'll play the trailer. So if you're, if you're watching on YouTube, you can watch it, but if not, um, you can listen to it. So I won't play the whole thing. It's about like two minutes long, but here's a sampling of what the show's about. When I was a child at the edge of the galaxy, I heard stories about a man who could forecast the future. But the story remained dark to me until many years later, until it became my story. Until it became the only story. You're familiar with my work, Psychohistory? Every mathematician has read your theory. It's not a theory. It's the future of mankind expressed in numbers. And the Empire won't like the future I predict. History is littered with charlatans and false messiahs. We should kill them. We could murder the man, but what about the movement, brother? Martyrs tend to have a long half-life. His math was right. The Empire is dying. Wars will be endless. <laughs> Thousand worlds reduced to cinders. Change is frightening. Especially to those in power. But we can soften the fall. So what's the plan? Okay, so, again, that's a short sampling, but essentially the premise of the books is the Galactic Empire, this massive Galactic Empire that's less, lasted for 12,000 years, is kind of like the Roman Empire. It is too expansive, it's, it's about to fall, it's become tyrannical, 
And this guy, Harry Seldon, um, discovers, develops, whatever, this technology to predict the future, the future of human history. And, of course, throughout the books, people think he's a wizard and they, they try to get him to predict their future or whatever. But he keeps saying over and over again, you know, you can't use what's called psychohistory to predict the future of an individual. All you can do is look at trends of all of humanity and predict broad trends. So what they do in the book is they convince the empire that the, um, the empire is going to collapse which is going to result in 12,000 years, I think it is, or something like that. Maybe 30,000 years, I think is actually what it is. Of just like this Dark Ages, barbarism, destruction, war, chaos. But that if they set up a foundation of scientists and you know smart people on this planet way out at the edge of the galaxy to basically record all of human knowledge and the, and, and every, the history of humanity and everything that we know, into these encyclopedias of all of their knowledge, doing so will reduce that 30,000 years of chaos down to only 1,000 years, and then a new empire will emerge, and okay, so this is the, the route we should go. And so that's kind of the overarching point of the book, but of course then twists and turns go through. Now, the part that I initially was like, oh man, this is going to suck, <laughs> and this is kind of the, 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 that knee-jerk mentality that I think that we need to check is because two of the the main characters in the books are a guy named Gail Dornick, and he's one of the first. He works with Harry, who's the guy who discovers psychohistory, and is one of the first people to help establish the foundation. And then there is Salvor Hardin, who is one of the first characters of like the next generation of people on the foundation. And in the book, they're men. And does not ever say their race in the books, but Isaac Asimov was a white dude, you know, 1940s, you're probably white, you know, whatever. That's what you picture in your mind, maybe. They're, they're white dudes. Well, then you watch the trailer, and they've recast them not only as women, but black women. So you can kind of look at that, and like I said, our reaction is to be like, oh, oh it's woke, it's woke, it's garbage, don't watch it. They oh, see their taking out the white men and replacing them with black women. And here's where I say, like, this is kind of the cautionary tale to say, well, first of all, that's not the right mentality to have. Like, these are fictional characters. If we don't care about race, why do we care whether they're black people or white people? Or, you know, maybe you can make the case for male, female, but why should we care? And because I love the book so much, I'm like, okay, well, I'm actually going to give this show a chance. I'm not going to just boycott it because of some silly reason, and I watched it, and again, it has its problems, it's, I think it's a little bit slower than it needs to be, especially in the middle section, but overall, I enjoyed it, it's got good reviews, it, it's got great acting, uh, Lee Pace, who was great, if you've seen the Hobbit movies, he plays the the Emperor, Brother Day, as, as he's called, and uh, he, he does, it's great, I think the, the acting is great, and so, why is it wrong to just dismiss a movie because of somebody's skin color or their gender? Well, again, we shouldn't care about those things. What we should care about is the ideas that are being promoted in the work of art, right? You know, as conservatives, what, what, what do we care? If somebody is black, white, brown, yellow, green, if they're promoting a good idea, we as conservatives say, yes, this is a, an individual or people that are promoting a good idea, we want to consume this good idea and promote it. That should be what matters. And I do think that the show foundation, although it takes deviations from the book, obviously, the the story that it's telling, I think, is a it has deeply conservative messaging in it. Okay, so here's a couple things throughout the show that I think are themes of the show. Of course, the the entire galactic empire is run by this tyrannical genetic dynasty. Okay, so the the, the genetic dynasty is run by the em emperor Cleon. So, you know, hundreds of years before the time of the foundation, Cleon the first, which you know, if it's not all that subtle, but Cleon is just an anagram for clone, right? C L E O N, C L O N E. And 
he started what was called a genetic dynasty. He basically thought, you know, I, I should always be the emperor, so we're just going to keep cloning myself. And so now in the time of the foundation, I think it's like Cleon the 14th or something like that. You know, they just keep replicating this clone. And they always have three Cleons that are ruling at one time. And they refer to themselves as brother. You know, we are empire. We are the empire is kind of their mantra. And there's brother Don, who's the youngest one. There's brother Day, who's the middle-aged one. He's played by Lee Pace. And then there's brother Dusk, who's the older one. So then when brother Dusk gets older and he's it's time for him to retire, they basically euthanize him and put him to sleep. And then they awaken another baby clone, who that clone becomes the new brother Don. Brother Don gets promoted to brother Day. Brother Day gets promoted to brother Dusk. And this just keeps going um, on and on and on. So... One of these themes is this idea that the foundation, way out in the re- far reaches of the empire, um, there, we are going to basically be revolutionaries. We are going to promote freedom uh, hidden from the empire and outside of the clutches of the empire. And what we are going to do is we are going to build essentially a new empire, a new uh, kingdom, but it's going to be based on freedom. It's going to be based on knowledge gained from the past and from our history in one of the lines that gets said a couple of different times and again this was when it came out you had to remember that you know a year ago year and a half ago this was you know not long after the the, the riots of 2020 you know burning things down this whole progressive mentality of we're going to tear down statues we're going to rip down statues we're going to erase our history we're going to you know all this kind of stuff and you had the characters who were part of the foundation, and of course you had the tyrannical empire, but the, the characters of the foundation were saying it takes more power to build than to burn. And so even this mentality of you know any revolutionary can just tear down the past. Any revolutionary can be critical. But what we're going to do is we're going to live outside of the empire, and we are actually going to build something which actually takes time and it takes hard work. We're not just going to tear down the empire. So the empire gets, of course, attacked by terrorists and stuff like that, and that's not good. But the foundation has this different principle. We're actually going to build rather than burn. So that's a good message. That, that's good messaging. The, the other really main one, and this, I think, is a theme running throughout the whole show, and, of course, this theme unfolds a little bit more. And, there, again, there's going to be a couple spoilers. And this actually lends itself to... So they're telling the same story as the books, but they're changing some of the themes. And th- they cast these two black women as the main characters instead of white men. But the the theme of the story is not, oh, look how powerful and great women are. Although, you know, a very superficial viewing of it could be, oh, see, they just want to have women be the heroes or whatever. And, and they're not the only heroes, but, you know, primarily they are. But much more than just, oh, look, we are women, so we're, you know, this this great thing. It's the idea that motherhood is what is the essential um, driver of humanity and driver of civilization. It is, and, and so this is one of the changes that they make from the books to the movies, or to the TV show, that they had to change it to women. And they had to make, in the book... Uh, Halver, or Salvor Hardin and Gail Dornick are not related. They're just two guys. But in this, you find out that Gail Dornick is Salvor Hardin's mother. And so things that are special about her, she has passed on to her daughter. And of course, you don't find this out till the end. So again, spoiler alert, sorry. But you would not have been able to tell that theme or that story if you didn't make them women and, and didn't make them related. So they had to, of course, be women. And, you know, we don't care about black, white, or well, the others. So the fact that they're black, I don't care. They they do a good performance. So <clears throat> this idea of, of motherhood, not just women, just we're strong and powerful because we're women. That's this theme of motherhood. And, again, we as conservatives, that's one of the main things that we are are so upset about by this progressive agenda is erasing motherhood and erasing womanhood with kind of this this trans agenda, but erasing motherhood and what it means to be a mother. And we tell, 
you know, mothers that, you you know, if you're a, a stay at home mom, well, you know, that's what's the value in that? It doesn't add anything to the economy. It doesn't. But and what's really great, this is something that I think ties in very heavily with this conservative message that I think that we need to be talking more about is elevating this role of motherhood. And Andrew Clavin in his book, The Truth and Beauty, he, he kind of analyzes, he walks through and talks about the, the story of Mary Shelley in, in creating Frankenstein, or well, Frank, the story of Frankenstein, but Frankenstein's monster, and how it's this story that really is not so much man playing God creating people out of nothing, because Frankenstein, Dr. Frankenstein doesn't do that. He creates a man out of pre-existing material. That's not what God does. But that is, you know, mothers and fathers come together and create new people. Here, though, in Frankenstein, we have a man man creating a monster without the help of a woman, without the help of a mother. And so Andrew Clavin talks about how really that's much more a statement of, you know, this this soulless monster, the, the Frankenstein's monster. He's a monster because he has no mother. And then it's, you know, as scientists have learned that it's the mother interacting with the child, these these synapses that are formed and these neurons that start firing, you know, as a as a mother holds her newborn and is interacting and the child's looking at the mother and the mom's interacting with the child. In a way, she's actually humanizing and making this person into a person. You know, of course, the extreme example of this would be the, the, the children in those, you know, um, homes where there's they have no mother they just have nurses that come around every once in a while and give them a bottle and but they just lay in a crib they have no human interaction they just turn into be soulless monsters and these you know crazy people they have all these problems so it's it's motherhood that is actually humanizing and building humanity and instilling the soul into humanity so salver harden and gail dornick their mother and daughter there's this there's this theme there but the even more clearly than that is Cleon, the emperor, who is just this tyrannical, you know, despot uh, of, uh, they're just clones. They have no mother. They are just, without the help of a mother, they are just reproducing themselves into new iterations of themselves. And they're just these monsters that are literally soulless. One of the, the, the plot lines is Cleon, the emperor starting to wonder, do I even have a soul? And the closest thing he has to a mother, a motherly figure, is this assistant. Her name's Dem Rizel, And you find out she is just a robot. She's just a humanoid robot. And she, you know, when you watch her act and stuff like that, she's like a soulless robot. And that's the only interaction he has as, for a mother or a womanly figure. And she's been there since the beginning of the, the, the dynasty of Cleon. And so she's been kind of this ever present mother, but she's not a human. She's just a soulless robot. And then Cleon in order to, and this is kind of the, the politics of the show, but there's this uprising, this insurgency that he views as part of his downfall as the empire happening on this religious planet, often the part of the galaxy. And it's this planet that's run by these women. And there's these three mothers that kind of head up this religion. And, of course, it's you know, probably supposed to be like the anti-Cleon, right? Instead of these three men, there's these women running this religion. And he goes there to kind of usurp and put in the person he wants to be. Because the, 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 the debate in this major religious uh, system that's in the empire is we are anti the Cleonic dynasty because they are just soulless. Cl- clones do not have souls. They are not humans. They're soulless monsters. So you had some people within this religion saying, no, we got to undo the the dynasty of these clones because they're just soulless monsters. And some saying, no, 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 that's fine, that's fine. So he wants to go and obviously promote his people. And part of gaining favor within their religion is in one episode he goes on this really kind of like a holy mecca, this, this, this pilgrimage that, you know, people rarely can make and they have to just kind of walk. No help. No one can help you. You have to just kind of stagger through this desert, this spiral, and people, you know, just drop dead, you know, on the way. But and you're you're supposed to get to what's called, if I'm recalling correctly, it's actually called the womb, is the center of this spiral. And when you finally get there after days of just struggling to get there, 
you enter into this water and you're supposed to, from the, from the gods, from the, the divine goddesses or whatever, they're supposed to give you this vision. Uh, you know, this it's like a speaking to your soul, so to speak, or whatever. And he goes on this pilgrimage and he's actually able to do it. He gets to this womb and he gets into the water to receive his vision. And of course, when he goes back to the goddesses, he says, here's the vision that I had. And he kind of waxes eloquent. And then people are like, oh, he does have a soul. He got a vision from the divine mother. And so, oh, you know, long live the Cleonic dynasty. Well, then when he's back in his private quarters talking to Demerzel, he actually says, I didn't have any vision. That was a lie. I got into the water and nothing happened. And, and Demerzel says, you know, that would be the most terrifying experience ever is to get into the water and realize you have no soul. And so you have this this tyrannical empire these these monsters who have no souls and why do they have no souls because they have no mother and then you have on the far reaches of the empire this this planet that's promoting freedom and individuality it's based on these this mother and daughter and and so there's even this theme again it's not womanhood it's not like they're elevating like women because they're better than men it's motherhood is integral to that message. And I think watching it as a conservative, you realize, holy cow, this is actually a very conservative message. This is something that we ought to be promoting. And and this is the problem, right, with with just writing something off because you look at it and you say, well, look, they just put some black women in there instead of white people. It's like, okay, well, you know, maybe there were people behind the scenes at Apple saying, oh, you know, we need some black people in this, whatever. And they had their diversity, equity, inclusion thing, whatever. But the point, the messaging in the show has a very conservative message, multiple conservative message, and a very positive pro-actual woman, actual motherhood message that I think is greatly under attack in our culture. I mean, people are... The, the idea of motherhood is, is like a, a badge of shame, it seems like. But the reality is motherhood is what makes people people. It's what keeps us from being these soulless Frankenstein monster type people, these soulless just clones, which, you know, when you when you think of kind of the progressive movement, that's what they want is just soulless, mindless automatons who just follow the empire. Just follow the regime. And so here you have a show that's promoting the exact opposite. The, the ideas of individuality, freedom, liberty, building something rather than just tearing down. Building based on our received history and our knowledge of the past. And built as a counter to the soulless, motherless regime of the empire. And built on the backs of a mother and her daughter, this relationship of a mother to her child. So to me, I think that's a very conservative message. It can get lost easily by a a very overly sensitive reaction by Christians and conservatives to just say, oh, there's black people in this thing. You know, I'm not going to watch this. Same thing with The Little Mermaid. You know, I, frankly, I don't care about Disney movies, whatever. <laughs> but... You know, if you can watch The New Little Mermaid and it actually has a good message to it, and maybe it doesn't. Who knows? And I think that's part of the problem, right? Is usually if you've got people who are progressive with anti-Christian values, who are also promoting diversity, equity, inclusion, these kinds of things, the diversity, equity, inclusion is the least of the problems. They're also pushing deeper, more disturbing uh, values. But the diversity should not be our concern. Who cares about that? If we as conservatives are saying what we care about is individual merit, individual quality, we're going to judge something based on what it brings to the table, then we have to give these things a chance. We can't just dispense with it because – and there, then you might find that there are actually conservatives in there putting in conservative messaging that in a way we should be sophisticated enough to be like, yes, this is a very solid conservative message. Let's promote it. Let, let's share it with people. And, and and let the, the let the progressive people let them be the small minded people who who can't even realize that they're making a conservative themed show because well well we've got black people in it so look how you know progressive we are and it's like okay well we will gladly take the black people the people of color and your conservative messaging and I think that's the position we ought to take 
as Christians and as conservatives. And so if you haven't seen Foundation, uh, check it out. You have to have an Apple TV subscription, obviously, so maybe that's prohibitive to some people. But eh, pay for it for a month, watch the 10 episodes within a month, and cancel your subscription or something. So I highly recommend it, and I highly recommend we get over our sensitivity to seeing people of color or diverse people being promoted in movies. Whatever. We don't care about that as conservatives, right? At least that's what we, we claim. So that's today's episode. I hope you enjoy it, and I hope you go out and watch Foundation. Have a good one. While Faith and Focus is a ministry of In Faith, the views and opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of In Faith as a mission.